Good afternoon and most welcome to Heidegger 1104. And today I will read a little bit from a new work of Charles H. Kahn and also add to that some comments. I will begin with some comments and this is about how knowledge works and how we can reach into it. When we establish fixed polarities, and this is this generalized idea of contradictions, a little bit like that there are such a thing as a contradiction in itself, and you can have the world and contradiction somehow, uh, in, although it's very hard to understand, Although it can be very hard to understand, this leads also to a, a whole road trip of different other problems. Problems that we encountered in this uh, lecture series all the way from the first lecture and now to 1104. And one of those is of course Gödel's incompleteness theorem, transcendental signified logocentrism, Wherever you try to fix everything, something little turns up. And it even goes to physics. As long as Einstein solved the problem with his space-time conundrum, a little new problem top popped up all of a sudden. And what was that? That was the fourth dimension. And in the fourth dimension, you had the singularity. Einstein himself had a sense that there could be a problem here. He sort of moved it one dimension up and then it turned up and all of, the, all of a sudden we had a singularity. Disastrous for the Einsteinian worldview. So you can sort of uh, make good for 20 cases of 100, uh, 99 cases of 100 or 999 cases of a thousand, or 99,000 of a hundred thousand. And I would say we are, have covered 999,999 cases, but is this small remaining case of Gödel's theorem? or the problem within uh, classical physics, like the dark problem, or the problem with ether, or the problem with the wave. Several small things, and we usually, we, we take a brush and we put them on, under the carpet. This is how we solve those things. It's anything but insignificant, anything, and I would say, our willingness to understand this or control it. I think this is what Ian McKilkes called the in, his, in the emperors and, and his new uh, in the master and his new uh, new uh, in the master and his empress, uh, emissary. What he's pointing to is exactly this: an overtake, whereby conquering all areas. It thinks, or the ego thinks, it is the sole master of everything. But that's not the case. It's the master of nothing. What do you say, Hans? What do you mean by master of nothing? I say, with static polarities, when they are sharply pointing to each other, you defy all knowledge. You have no access to the world whatsoever. And in the examples coming from the natural world, as winter and summer, it becomes abundantly clear. There's no longer any risk of any mis misunderstanding. 
Winter, yes, is the opposite in some cases of summer, but you lose out of the whole thing. All details of them. Nothing remains. All differences, all quality, and as exactly as Friedrich Nietzsche wrote in the Gay Science, we lose knowledge at such, because distance is making it a eroding factor, taking away all substance, existence, and lack of thereof. And in the end, we end up with a postmodern world with no differences at all, i.e. no knowledge. And I see here, by reading Heraclitus, I more and more understand another way of explaining of what Ian McKilchrist explained from a neurological, biological side, how it is in knowledge itself. A certain take on knowledge causes havoc. And my idea is that if it weren't not for the Milesian philosophers of nature, I don't think Heraclitus would have been able to write his work. It is necessary that he was exposed to the Milesians so he could see what that could lead to. I think that was an impelling factor. Sure, I'm quite convinced Heraclitus would have been a fantastic philosopher anyway. There is no doubt about that. But what makes Heraclitus, that takes the Miletian's uh, philosopher of nature. I think that pushed him in the right direction. Usually we are pushed in the wrong direction. Look at Plato, he went further and further away from reality. In, an, in the end, everything was contradictions. And the law of the excluded middle, it is nothing short of a disaster. And oddly enough, by trying more and more and stronger and stronger and go to reality, we lose it all. We lose reality, we lose the sense of life, we lose balance, we lose the privilege of being present in our own lives and in physics. We are losing out on both ends. I'm pretty happy with that conclusion, I'm not sure it's, if it's true. But it's great and it would be nice to see what Ian McGilchrist, for instance, would we think about such a solution. That knowledge itself, once it strives into either or, all differences, all of reality, all of depth disappear. Space in itself becomes uh, an exaggerated either or, uh, where it is the case, going 10 meters, meters forward, we take you back to the same place if you go 10 meters backwards. Something is not true of space because space is not a fundamental in, in that way of thinking. So by starting with contradictions, I know this sounds much easier one than it is, but it's in a nutshell still good to remember. By starting with the contradictions, we end into a whole canopia of problems where the transcendental signified logocentrism, the metaphysics of presence, uh, the fixation of existence like Parmenides, and the horror vacui, the going away from the apeiron, all those factors are fueled by contradictions. And in a way, yes, Heraclitus cut to the chase, it goes directly to the kernel. But it's excruciatingly hard to understand one's approach directly. It cannot be attacked directly. All those three things we did in the lecture series, going through Hahnemann, for instance, Kahneman, uh, 
Bradel, David Bradel with the cerebellum, what we did with Heidegger, not to forget Daddy Da, Wittgenstein, all those lectures with quantum physics, looking into the logic of Graham Priest and contrast that to the ordinary classical logic, which is nothing but classical. It's not even logic in the strictest sense. It's a new invention. Going into semantics, looking into language, we put, uh, picked up on Austin. That was helpful. That made the direction broad in the beginning, maybe pointing divergently, but with the divergence we thought we found also convergence and i thought actually in the beginning we will only have diver divergence so it was an interesting surprise that i noticed more and more bodily first more balance but also spiritually mentally that is actually led to coherence convergence going more in one direction but at the same time having that one direction only because we allowed all other direction to play with it's like having a concert you have violins you have the piano you have the solo singer you have the clarinet you have all the string instruments maybe on the left aisle you have the drums, you have a uh, cembalo, you have uh, other wind instruments, uh, maybe you have a backpack, I don't know what, you have all those things. And together they make one unison com concert. And of course, our struggling with case theory, James Gleek, very very interesting very helpful comparing james gleek to quantum mechanics seeing differences but also seeing similarities both similarities and differences has been helpful and i think like bodily we have come to understand that contradictions are not what they seem at the start they give more and I would say especially important and forceful in this, in this discourse, in this context, is the voice of the friend. By repeating that, almost like a hymn or a mantra or Te Deum Laudam or something repetitive, the understanding builds itself. Because in the real world, repetition is not as repetitive as it sounds. What do you say about that? It is iteration. Iteration, and we also learn more from Susie Froebel and her fractal theory of sound, which also included vision. We learn neurologically that we send out from the eyes, from the ears, three times as much neurological information than we, so to speak, receive. But by the, the Klein bottle and Lucio Diego Rappaport, we learn more and more the importance of seeing the subject as situated in the objective world, and vice versa. This was sort of repeated when we went into Heraclitus, uh, the fragments by Charles H. Kahn, that made, was made even clearer and I started to realize our degradation of uh, feelings instead of being something that gave action or was action it is today sort of put down because of this dominance of the contradictions or the left hemisphere depending how you want to see it But there is a disallowance uh, uh, in the dictatorship or the emissary of the contradictions because they cover everything.
Something proven by Gödel in the twenties is an impossibility. You cannot both have complete, completeness and coherence. That message should have been taken to its point. And I think that is done by Gödel Escherbach by Douglas Hofstadter, which he also includes the divergence and convergence of the classical works of Bach. Do to recommend to listen to Bach. You can clearly see not only many instruments but many melodies going simultaneously deepening the music, making it even sharper, even clearer, convergent, with all extra divergency. And this is also the matter of time. The hastity of modern times often leads to the idea that we should have slowness of action. Maybe there, is a TV ser there was a TV series in Sweden, I never saw it, it was called Mandelbaum's Farm or something like that, Mandelstam's Farms. That was to give a sense of slowness, of timelessness. But they are not opposing pairs. Swiftness and slowness are not contradictory in that matter. They are not generalized contradictions. Therefore, Heraclitus sings another song, he has another concert. In that concert, you can be absolutely instantaneously swift and still wait. Yes, this is my conviction. And I would say that idea of the contradictions conquering everything, being the dictator of everything, obliterating knowledge, obliterating time, as I mentioned, but also space by the idea of the contradictory in space. That, for instance, the distance in front of me contradicts the distance back on me, so I can get back to the same point. Devastating. Helpful to think here of the Klein bottle, the Möbius strip, that shows that space in itself in its absolutely non-localizable. There is no outer point to show you in time or space how you get back to the same thing. The same thing, looking at very carefully, seem to not mean anything at all. And this trap, if you like, or opportunity, it's a trap and or opportunity, in the eyes of Heraclitus, my opinion, yes, I'm too, I'm too anxious to get into the text, I just have to jump into it. And you look at Heraclitus, author Charles H. Kahn, source American Philosophy, Philosophic, Philosophical Quarterly, volume num, 1, number 3, July 1964, pages Novelty is a relative concept, and in a sense, the preacher is surely right. There is nothing new under the sun. This seems particularly true in the case of an author like Heraclitus, who has been a subject for the very frequent makings of books and articles 
for well over a century. Nor does the flood of commentary show any signs of abating. In proposing, therefore, to take a new look at Heraclitus, I certain, certainly do not pretend to offer a, a picture entirely different from everything that anyone else has ever seen. It is possible that one or two of my predecessors, and notably Reinhardt, might have recognized my new view as only a logical development of their own. But the interpretation to be put forth here does, I think, contrast with much recent work on Heraclitus, particularly in English. And in one respect, at least, it diverges from the mainstream of Heraclitian scholarship since deals. This point of disagreement, which I shall begin, concerns the literary form and hence the semantic status of Heraclitus's discourse. If my view is correct, many commentators are in danger of radically mistaking the nature of his work and the quality of his thought. From this preliminary question of form, I shall proceed to the philosophical content of the discourse, passing in review its major themes. The aim throughout will be to present not a detailed exegesis of individual fragments, but an overall framework of interpretation into which every fragment will fit. The presupposition of this approach is that piecemeal discussion of individual texts may be may become arbitrary and pointless unless it's based upon a sound appreciation of Heraclitus, Heraclitus's distinct character as a thinker and stylist. stylist. The interpretation will conclude with a topic I try to lie at the center of all Heraclitus's thought and concern, the nature of the human soul and its relationship to the divine principle of unity in cosmos. What kind of book did Heraclitus compose? Or was it a book at all? Is it possible to form any general idea of a work from which we possess some 130 random quotations? Early editors such as Bywater tried to group the fragments by subject matter. Since 901, however, the standard arrangement has been that of deals, which lists the fragments alphabetically according to the name of the author who happens to cite them. This apparently irrational procedure may be justified on sound philological grounds. Recognizing that any arrangement by subject matter was to some extent arbitrary, deals wished above all to avoid imposing any personal interpretation upon his edition of the text. In fact, however, by atomistic character of his arrangement, he has largely succeeding in imposing his own view of Heraclitus's work as lacking in literary structure. Odis was mot motivated not only by the difficulty of reconstructing the origin sequence of all fragments, he also called attention to their aphoristic style, their resemblance to the gnomes or sayings of the seven sages, and he suggested that these sentences had originally been set down in a kind of notebook or 
philosophical journal with no literary form or unity linking them to one another. He thus implied after all that the chaotic pattern in his arrangement gave a true picture of Heraclitus' own composition. In the case of Heraclitus, arrangement and interpretation are in fact inseparable from one another, as Deal saw in the work of his predecessors. His mistake was to imagine that his own order could be an exception. Our interpretation will be based upon the opposite assumption, that Heraclitus's discourse as a whole was as carefully and artistically composed as are the preserved parts, and that the formal ordering of the whole was probably as much an element in its total meaning as in the case of any lyric poem from the same period. The true parallel for understanding of Heraclitus' style is, I suggest, not Nietzsche, but his own contemporaries, Pindar and Aeschylus. The extant fragments reveal a command of word order, imagery, and studied ambiguity as an effective and as a self-assured that to be found in any work of these two poets. We can, I think, best imagine the stru structure of Heraclitus's little book on analogy of the great choral odes, with a fluid but carefully articulate, articulated movement from image to aphorism, from myth to riddle to contemporary, contemporary illusion. Yet, the intellectual unity of Heraclitus' work was certainly greater than that of any archaic poem, since its final intent was much more explicitly didactic. In fact, its central theme was precisely an assertion of the principle of unity. Hen panta in I all things are on one the content of this very general formula seems to have been filled in by a coherent chain of statements linked together not by logical argument but by the interlocking ideas and verbal echoes with an elaborate use of imagery wordplay and enigma Theophrastus found the result incomplete and contradictory, but he was looking for a prosaic exposition of physical theories. Heraclitus is not merely a philosopher, but a poet as well, and furthermore, one who chose to speak in tones of prophecy. The literal effect he aimed at was scarcely that of didactic prose. It may be better it may better be compared to the impact of Aeschylus or Restia, the solemn and dramatic unfolding of great truth, step by step, where the sense of what has gone before is continually modified and enriched by its echo in what follows. <laughs> that Heraclitus's discord possessed an artistic design of this type can scarcely be demonstrated, but it is made a priori probable by the clear evidence of literary artistry in every fragment where the original wording has been preserved intact. Furthermore, indirect evidence for a larger structure is provided by the impossibility of interpreting many of his statements in isolation. For example, how are we to understand fragment 60? The way up and down is one and the same. The literal interpretation of this remark poses no difficulties, but taken in isol isolation it is so ambiguous as to be devoid of any significance. 
everything turns upon what kind of way is meant and that we could only learn from the context and that we could only learn from the context from the sentences that came before and after and the case of this fragment is typical unless we provide them with a context many of Heraclitus' statements cannot be interpreted in any significant way this suggests one of two things either these ambiguous fragments originally had no definite sense or Heraclitus himself gave them a significant context There's, there is of course no chance of restoring these shattered and incomplete fragments to the order in which Heraclitus himself disposed them but once we assume that Heraclitus ordering had some plan it becomes the interpreter's task to arrange them in the most meaningful pattern he can find not only does arrangements arrangement imply interpretation interpretation in turn involves arrangement and the method methodical complement to a new interpretation of Heraclitus would be a complete recording reordering of the fragments to be replace the meaningless sequence of deals I hope to present such an arrangement on another occasion here we must be content to the state to state the principle of contextual juxtaposition as an element in the total meaning of Heraclitus's words there is more to be said about the literal equality of the work in particular concerning Heraclitus's use of paradox riddle and verbal ambiguity but this stylistic features may conveniently be discussed in the context of his thought as a whole first paragraph or number number two the logos style and substance the thought of Heraclitus constitutes a fully articulated vision of the world one which is ultimately to be understood in its own terms but in order to penetrate within the Heraclitian universe we must first locate it against a definite historical background This background may be defined by reference to three or four fixed points. In the first place, Heraclitus takes for granted the Miletian view of the natural world as cosmos, an organized structure of elemental principles and opposing powers functioning in accordance with the cyclical order of time. In the second place, he is familiar with a new conception of deity, deity as mind or nous, formulated above all by Xenophanes, a conception developed in close connection with natural philosophy and in conscious opposition to the Homeric portrayal of the gods. Furthermore, he is familiar with another decisive innovation, the new view of the human soul as a potentially immortal and hence divine a view associated about associated above all with the name of Pythagoras finally Heraclitus adopted from his predecessor the notion that the universe is pervaded by the principle of mathematical measure or proportion and that is this prince that this principle is strikingly embodied in the musical attunement or harmonia of strings of a lyre a similar mathematical conception is implicit 
in the Miletian conception of the cosmos, but the form which it takes for Heraclitus is probably influenced by the Pythagorean speculation on the relationship between musical intervals and numerical proportion. This triple influence upon Heraclitus is reflected in the fragments by his personal texts on Xenophanus and Pythagoras and on Miletus in the person of Hecateus. Other thinkers have been known to attack men to whom they are indebted, but to say that Heraclitus was influenced by his predecessor is not to say that he agreed with them. Much my point before here, I would say. More interesting than the fact of influence itself is the nature of transformation which earlier ideas have undergone as a result of their appropriation by Heraclitus. The points of contact have too often be, been interpreted as indication that Heraclitus and his predecessors are concerned with the same questions, that their thought is as it were on the same level. On the contrary, he clearly expresses his contempt for the Pilumafia the mere erudition which does not lead to significant insight. In Heraclitus's view, men like, men like Xenophanus and Pythagoras fail to see the true meaning of their own knowledge. Whatever he has taken over from them must mean something very different from him. The distinctive character of Heraclitus's own view is suggest, suggested at the very outset of his discourse by an emphatic reference to the term for discourse itself. Quote, Although this word logos is true forever, man ever failed to comprehend, both be before hearing it and when they hear it first. Though all things come to pass according to this logos, men are like the untried when they try such words and deeds as I set forth sorting out each thing according to its nature and declaring how it is. The term Logos come to us laden with the whole history of Western philosophy and theology to avoid anachronism and to seize the meaning of Logos in all its concreteness and the complexity which it possessed for Heraclitus we must briefly recall the early history of the term before it came to mean the rational faculty of the soul, the reason of the universe or the word of God. The word logos is a verbal noun whose primitive meaning is inseparable from that of the verb ligean to which it corresponds. In in its most current classical sense, legain means to say, and logos accordingly means saying, utterance, speech, as in the standard antithesis of logos and ergon, word and deed. But logos always involves more than mere speech, and this added element of meaning largely stems from the original force of the verb. In its earliest usage, for example in Homer, legin means either one, to pick up or gather, two, to count or enumerate. The underlying idea reflected in both senses seemed to be to group or gather passing from one thing to another to the early use of the verb for counting corresponds to the frequent and classical sense of logos as computation, reckoning, account. The notion of enumeration also gives rise to the more specifically mathematical meaning of logos as ratio or proportion. A geometric ratio may be seen as a special case of the grouping of things for counting and computation.
in parenthesis this is something we uh, went into look to when we had the sacred dimensions of room time and space space time and, and knowledge and this is also the knowledgeable time of the Klein bottle it is very important to understand that the Klein bottle is also knowledge and time On the other hand, the verb legain, to count, like the English to tell, or the French compte, may pass over into the sense of to recount, narrate, conter, and hence again like tell, into the more general sense of to say. In this way, the noun logos came to mean a tale or a narration, and by extens extension, any act of speaking or saying. But as legain means not merely to talk, but to say something significant, so logos, even when it denotes speech, always refers to the meaning and content of the words as well. Because of its other uses, it may also carry with it some connotations of rationing, rational collecting, arranging or enumerating, and it is these collateral meanings which explain the extraordinary importance of the term in Greek philosophy. The early poets may use logos and mythos as synonyms to denote any speech or story. But when a philosopher, but when the philosophers undertook to distinguish between a rational account and an all-wise tale then naturally opposed logos as recent meaningful discourse to mythos a merely legendary tale and so it was that the distinction between myth and reason was born multa bene very important Returning to Heraclitus, we can see that his logos is first and foremost his concrete utterance, but this, that this, his discourse is never a matter of mere words. The logos has a content, a sense and structure that most men do not grasp even when their ears are listening to the words. That is what it means to say that they have barbarian souls which do not understand the language of the Logos. And the content of Heraclitus's discourse is neither more nor less than the world order which he asserts. All things come to pass according to this Logos. Thus, from the very first sentence of his book, Heraclitus' use of the word logos reflects the fundamental ambiguity of the term. On the one hand, a specific utterance, on the other hand, an ordinary relationship between things which is reflected in discourse, including the quantitative relationship reflected, reflected in calculation or ratio, The quantitative sense is unmistakable in several uses of logos in the extant fragments. C is measured into the same logos as before it became earth. The logos of the soul is so deep that we cannot find its end terms or limits. Soul has a ratio or an account which is self-augmenting. In virtue of this ambiguity systematically maintained, Heraclitus' use of the term logos for his discourse implies at the same time an allusion to the quantitative measures that mark the world order, the measures which the sun must respect. 
and according to which the cosmic fire is lighted and quenched. Thus, wordplay for Heraclitus becomes not so much a literary mannerism as a revelation in language of the hidden unity of the universe, a hint of the ordinary structure which his logos evokes. Now the term logos is itself particularly suited to this type of meaningful wordplay and equally apt as an expression of the profound unity of things. For as we have noted, the etymological sense is that of gathering together and above all of rational, rational collecting of things by number and sequence. In the linguistic usage of Heraclitus' day, the connotations of gathering had become dormant, but they could easily be revived in certain compounds and combinations, as for example in the expression koinos logos, applied to the men who make common cause and are to be counted together. Hence, when Heraclitus says that although the logos is common, most men live as if they had wisdom of their own. He is playing on the sense of gathering together, which is latent in the term logos. Just as when he says, it is wise listening not to me, but to the logos, to agree that all things are one. He is playing on the sense of common logos, by his use of the term homo logain, to agree, literally to come together in Logos, to say the same thing. Thus, behind Heraclitus' concrete use of Logos for his own discourse, lie two interrelated senses for the gathering together of things. On the one hand, Logos as human speech points to the coming together of many meanings in words and wordplay. On the other hand, Logos as an account of the world points to the convergent unity of things, computed by their measure and proportion. Puns and ratios are equally legit legitimate devices for revealing the latent harmonia. The hidden, fitting together, of things in the world and fact. Uh, in parenthesis, I usually call that resonance. You can think of a tuning fork. If you hit that, that resonance will start all tuning forks that are in close distance to start go by the same tune. It's amazing to see, but this is actually also something described as quantum state. It is getting instantly transferred, vibrating in the same manner. Perhaps no other Greek author, or none except Aeschylus, has so systematically exploited the possibilities of ambiguity and elusiveness that are implicit in all human speech. The characteristic expression of this ambiguity is the wordplay of which the fragments are full. The most obvious example is that of the bow, whose name is life, but whose work is death. Here, the apparent oppos opposition between word and deed between name and reality points, in fact, to the latent agreement, 
Life and death, like day and night, are one. The drone bow is the symbol of their unity. The statement concerning the name of the bow must be read not only as a pun, but as a riddle whose meaning we can guess if we understand Heraclitus' view of the unity of life and death. There are other statements in the fragments, unintelligible at first, which can probably be understood only as riddles. Heraclitus himself refers to the riddling language of the Delphic Oracle, which neither speaks nor hides its meaning, but gives a sign, say my nay. The parallel suggests once more that Heraclitus's procedure is conceived of less as a liter literary device than as an inevitable consequence of human ignorance and the recondite nature of truth. Like the utterance of Apollo, what Heraclitus has to say is necessarily enigmatic. Because human beings do not have the insight which divine wisdom can be taken for granted. For the modern critic, these puns and riddles seem designed to dazzle the reader, not only to catch his attention, but also perhaps, like the Socratic sting of ignorance, to pr produce a temporary torpor of the mind that may prepare it for further insight. But Heraclitus would probably have refused to consider this as a result of his skill in manipulating words. It is language itself which, by its dual capacity to reveal and obscure, provides the natural sign for the multifarious and largely latent connections between things like the Sibyl, whose prophecy is in virtue not of, her, not of her own knowledge, but that of God. Heraclitus speaks to us not in his own name, but as a prophet of the Logos, the rational account founded in the cosmic structure that makes all things one. Three. An understanding of Heraclitus' view, views on cosmology is complicated by the fact that whereas the doxographical tradition gives a rather detailed account of what purport to be his physical doctrines, only a relatively small number of the extant fragments are explicitly concerned with questions of natural philosophy. Furthermore, among the physical fragments are to be found such metaphorical statements as all things are exchanged for fire and fire for all things, such ambiguous assertions as the way up and the way down are one and the same. And such apparently banal remarks as if there were no sun, it would be night. There has therefore been an understandable reluctance among modern scholars to accept the classical view of Heraclitus given by Aristotle and his followers, which makes, him, makes of him an Ionian natural philosopher of the same type as Anaximander or Anaxagoras. Even in antiquity there was perplexity on this point. The ancient literature who forged the correspondence between Heraclitus and Darius 
was no doubt drawing upon Hellenistic commentaries when he makes the Persian king say to our philosopher, in some places if your discourse is interpreted literally, it seems to contain speculation concerning the entire world order and what occurs within it. But there is much room for doubt and the most learned are at loss as to your true meaning. At least one ancient critic was more positive. Disputing the accuracy of its customary title, he maintained that book was not about nature, but about man's life in society. What is said concerning nature serves as a paradigm or example. These ancient statements, based upon the fami familiarity with the book as a whole, confirm the impression made by the extant fragments that Heraclitus is not to be interpreted simply as a natural philosopher, a physikos in Aristotle's sense, from the persons whom he chooses to attack and occasionally to praise. It is clear that he thought of himself primarily as a rival to the poets and a wise man, not the scientist Anaximander and Anaximenes, but the sages Thales and Bias.